networks and I'm um, gonna go through uh, um, all of uh, some of the material we started covering in the last class and then wrap up this lecture. So my intent is that this Friday I want to use Friday to uh, if I don't get to finish this today I'll finish it uh, in a few uh, first minutes of Friday. But Friday I want it to be about showing you what's the latest state of the art in the world of neural networks. There's a lot of cool things happening. Um, you know like Microsoft state of the art in speech recognition now uses a neural network. I want to tell you about that. I want to tell you about the best object, uh, you know the number one neural networks now for object recognition. Which are actually the number one techniques in general for object recognition. Um, neural nets are winning a lot of the cargo competition, so I'm going to tell you what are the, what's the sort of latest and what is being done in Google X labs and what is being done in um, Canada. Because right now we're actually going through a stage where uh, there, there's been a lot of cool things happening in this world. Um, so Friday is not going to be your usual undergrad lecture off to and this is how we do it. Friday is going to be about what's happening out there and what are the open questions. So there's more focusing on the problems that other than and not the answers. Um, okay, but let's go back to what we understand well. Logistic regression, again we revised this. Um, let's assume we have two inputs into a logistic unit and so our data would be of uh, what's shown there on the left. Um, if you have two inputs, you would have two columns of inputs. Um, I is the index over the data. And then the labels are 0 or 1. Okay, so that's the data that you're given, just like the tweet data. And your task is then to separate the positive tweets from the negative tweets. Spam from non-spam. From non-spam uh, or your patient is going All right, so I will have to any other thing you might want to classify. Okay, so when we come up with a boundary that for the two features allows us, uh, as in this case in 2D, allows us to come up with a, a division. The boundary for logistic regression is a line and we saw that before. The picture is the logistic function you can think of as an S and so if you cut it in half you get uh, a line. In general in higher dimensions you get a plane and a hyperplane and so on. Um, for logistic regression we also uh, saw that uh, uh, we can write the log li uh, its likelihood. So in this particular case um, the output of this neuron is just a number between 0 and 1 yi because it's the output of a sigmoid. So yi is between 0 and 1 and that's why we use a sigmoid so we can interpret the uh, output as a probability. And then we said in the last class that we, um, we could model the y's as a Bernoulli distribution with success probability yi hat. Okay, so the probability of yi being 1 is yi hat. The probability of yi being 0 is 1 minus yi hat. And then if you have n observations and they're independent, then uh, as always we just multiply the probabilities. Okay. So that's a neural network with one neuron, which is essentially logistic regression. Um, however, sometimes we want to do better. We, the data might not be linearly separable, in which case we want to use nonlinear functions. Like for example in that picture I'm showing you two nonlinear functions. Um, the blue linear function is for a neural network that has very few neurons in the hidden layer, probably three or four. 
And then the purple line would be for a neural network that would have like 20 neurons in the hidden layer. So again, you see the trade-off. The more neurons, the better your separation. With lots of neurons, you get zero training error. But the problem is that the test set would do poorly. So, so how do you choose the number of neurons? You do cross-validation. It's again an issue of complexity control. Um, another thing you can do is you can add an L2 regularizer to the neural network because then the L2 regularizer will set some of the thetas to zero. And again, it will smooth that decision boundary. Okay, so the setup with more neurons is exactly the same as for logistic regression. You still have your input data, which could be anything, and then you have your uh, output data, which is binary. And what we model is the distribution of the outputs. So once again, the distribution is not over the x's. The x's are given. The distribution is over the y's. And the y's are 0, 1, they're Bernoulli. So we used a Bernoulli model. The only difference with uh, logistic regression is the following. For logistic regression, um, the mapping to go from input to output is a very simple one. We first compute this u, and then we just put this u, which is basically a, uh, a linear regression, and then we put the linear regression through uh, the sigmoid to give us a number between 0 and 1. With the neural network is a bit more involved because now you have two linear regressions, one, two, one for each u. The first linear regression is for the top neuron, and then the second one is for the bottom neuron in the hidden layer. And then each of these linear regressions um, gets weighted. Uh, so first they get squashed through a sigmoid function, and then they get weighted and then they get squashed through a sigmoid function again. So we have a complex uh, transformation of the data and that's essentially what allows us to get a nonlinear boundary. Um, however, the probabilistic model is still the same. It's still a Bernoulli model. The only thing is now why I had is a much more complex expression. So which is essentially a nonlinear function. A composition of these sigmoid functions. And the treatment is as before for a neural network. If you now have many data from 1 to n, then the overall likelihood is just the product of the likelihoods of each data point. So it's a product of Bernoulli's. And one thing I hadn't covered in the last class, that I'm going to go over it now, is that if you want the cost function, if you don't want to think, it's just like least squares, if you don't want to think in a probabilistic sense, but all you want to minimize is a cost, like the sum of square errors and so on, um, it's possible to transform a maximum likelihood problem to a problem of cost minimization. Cost also has other different uh, words that I used to refer to it, like the objective, and quite often uh, people use the term energy. In neural networks, people like to use energy. And so minimizing the cost is essentially the negative log likelihood. Um, and you can see that very easily uh, for a Gaussian. Actually, I will show that to you soon for a Gaussian. Um, for, uh, for a Bernoulli distribution, if you take the log and negate, you, know, you essentially get this very simple expression, which is the entropy, the cross entropy. And that sort of makes sense because you want to minimize entropy. You want to minimize uncertainty. So the objective function makes sense. Um, now, there is a clear mapping between cross entropy and uh, likelihood. Okay? One is just a negative log of the other. Same as the quadratic error in linear regression is just the negative log of a Gaussian. Um, I have seen papers, even actually recently read one, where they, they were comparing and this is actually very common in blogs, where you'll have people fighting whether it's better to do maximum likelihood or minimize cross entropy. They actually are the same, obviously. But people will have fights in blogs and then, you know, I tried this data set and no, you shouldn't have done that data set. You have to do it in a serious data set. That's where you can tease out the differences. 
and then someone will come, I spent 5,000 on Amazon and run it on so many cores and found a difference of 1 times 10 to the minus 32. Um, and you know, quite often if you don't understand the mapping between costs and probabilities, which is one of the problems that I think confronts a lot of people out there, because people in general have a poor understanding of probability, um, then you know, you're wasting resources, you're wasting your time doing things you shouldn't be doing. Okay, so cross entropy is the natural cost function for maximum likelihood when you have binary observations. And we also saw some examples of neural networks. Friday I'll go over some more. Um, we started looking at regression. Now in regression, I'm going to use a different kind of output neuron. Instead of the output neuron being a sigmoid, I'm going to use the identity. So I'm using this line to indicate basically the identity neuron, U21. Okay, so y hat is just that uh, combination. And particular y hat is just as written at the bottom here is theta 5 plus theta 6 times the output of neuron 1 plus theta 7 times the output of neuron 2. And we had had a discussion where we said that theta 5 controls the height of the sigmoid. Theta 6 sort of squashes it up and down. Theta 1 moves the sigmoid left and right. And theta 2 squashes it horizontally. So either thin or fat uh, sigmoid. So we have everything to control. So we can squash it in both directions and we can lift it and we can shift it. So we have these very nice bricks basically. And you can just add up many of these bricks and you can construct any function. Like in this example, if your data happens, when we're doing regression, we're mapping from x's to y's. If your data happens to have that shape, then we only need two neurons. Okay, so if you want a table, you basically just need to add up um, a neuron that looks like um, that's going to the left and a neuron that's going to the right. If we negate, if we negate the thetas, we can change the direction of the sigmoid. Because you're squashing it and eventually squash it to the other side. Any reason for using the identity? Yes, good question. Why am I using the identity there as opposed to a sigmoid? What would happen if I had a sigmoid there? My y hats would be in what range? If that was zero and one. What would be the problem if my y hats are between 0 and 1 and my y's are 6.2 and 5? Could I ever predict y if my y hat was between 0 and 1? You need to scale them. Right. So the sigmoid isn't creating a scaling to 0, 1. I don't need that scaling here. In fact, the scaling here would be wrong because my y's are the real line in this case. So all a sigmoid is doing is just scaling some To value. 0 and 1 so that we can interpret it as a probability. I just noticed that uh, you could have the same y hat with different, um, if you interchange different thetas. Like if you map theta 6 to theta 7 and theta 1 to theta 4, stuff like that, um, it's the same. Yes, and so if you shift, percentage. if you move the neurons like this, if you permute the neurons, you still get the same neural network. Is that sort of not that? Actually, that has an implication, a big implication in optimization, which means that up to permutation, the parameters are unidentifiable. And so what that does is your cost function will have now many, many minima, possibly you know, a factorial number of minima. Now, if those minima are very close to each other. If they're far away, then any of those solutions is a good solution. But if they're close to each other, you get a very nasty uh, error landscape. These models are NP-hard. In 540, I show uh, the mapping between these and the, 
the SAT problem, which is a typical example of an NP-hard problem. Okay, um, the other thing, so why I, in particular, to continue answering this question, um, why I had, I'm going to interpret in the linear case as the mean, the prediction. And I want that prediction to be a number between minus infinity and infinity. That's why I keep that linear neuron. Now, the picture says it all. That we're doing regression from x to y. Any point is distributed according to a Gaussian. That's the model that I'm using now. And if any point is distributed according to a Gaussian, then the picture is as, as it shows there. You have a, a specific yi. If you evaluate the, the height of the point, the ith point, that's yi. Uh, the value at the, uh, at the line, at the fit, neural net fit is just yi hat. That's the function yi hat. The difference between yi hat and yi is what I'm showing in red, and that's the cost. And then since each point has, is Gaussian distributed, and by each point I mean each y, there is no noise in the axis again. The noise is in the y's. It's just like linear regression. The only thing is we change the line for a, an arbitrary curve. Instead of a line, we're now putting basis functions together and doing an arbitrary curve. In effect, neural networks, that's the only thing that they bring in into linear regression, that they allow us to go nonlinear. But the probabilistic models are the same. The cross validation is the same. The whole treatment is the same. So if you can do linear regression, you can do neural nets. It's just now we create nonlinear functions by adding many basis functions. And so the mean is y hat. Now we have a nonlinear function, so I'm just saying that y i hat is just a, uh, this function, which is the neural net that depends on theta and the input x i. And now if I take the negative log of p of y i given x i comma theta, I basically get the sum of squared errors. So uh, in particular, in the first part of the course, we spent quite a bit of effort showing that minimizing the sum of squared errors is the same as maximizing a Gaussian likelihood. And then, of course, what we could do is we could add now rich regularizers. And this is the sort of thing you get to do for homework six. You get to play with trying to get good predictions or for the project. OK, so now let's look at another, a more interesting case. This one is now a bit different from anything we've seen so far. But quite often, you want to classify data not into one or two class, sorry, into two classes, but you quite often want to classify it into more classes. For example, you might want to take news articles and you might want to automatically classify them as sports or uh, Vancouver news or fashion or comedy or whatever it is that you want to classify your articles into. Um, and so in this case you have more categories and we need to deal with a problem that goes as shown here that goes from 2D to actually three possible classes. We're go and so we're going to use the following trick. We're going to do a one of k, in co what's called a one of k encoding. If your class, if a data point is of class 2, so let's assume that we're essentially classifying images and we want to say red, green, blue. Those are our three classes. If you're of class 2, then what we do is we, we're going to label the y's in this form. We're going to put a 1 in class 2 and zeros in the other classes. If you're class 1, we put a 1 uh, we use a 1, 0, 0 to encode um, class 1 and then the last class would be a 0, 0, 1. So we basically encode 1, 2 and 3 as 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0 and 0, 0, 1. The reason for doing that is because now I can present to the output um, uh, basically when I train this I'm going to set up the targets for the three outputs to be those numbers, 1, 0, um, and 1, say. Sorry, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, or 0, 0, 1. What we will get, in effect, is a decision boundary, or a discriminant boundary, as it's, also, as it's often called, that separates, in this case, three classes. Um, class 
two, from class one, from class three. Okay. How do we do this? And also, we want probabilities. Right? So we want to still be able to say that, that what we're going to get out of here is a probabilistic interpretation that allows me to tell what is the probability that you know, the image uh, is red, what's the probability that it's green, and what's the probability that it's blue. This is going to be our solution. We're going to define the probability that the label says of class 2, which is 0, 1, 0, given the input in theta, um, using this function. We're going to use this function because it's going to give us something positive. Okay, because if I take e to the y2 divide, if I exponentiate anything, I get something positive. And because I normalize um, the outputs, so I, I take e to the y2, that guarantees that it's positive. If I normalize by all the three outputs, now I'm ensuring that I will get something that will sum up to one. And I'm going to talk about this as the probability of y2. Um, this function has a name. Um, it's called the softmax function. It's used with neural networks, but it's also used with a lot of other machine learning techniques. It's used with logistic, you could use it with logistic regression, because in fact you could just do now a logistic regression. You could get rid of that hidden layer and it would be back to logistic regression. And that would be essential logistic regression with many classes, which was a question one of you asked me a couple of days ago. Identity function Identity function? Yeah, because the yi is to be between either 0 or 1. Oh, I don't need them. I don't need the yi's to be, the yi hats to be between 0 and 1. Why don't I? Uh, you were labeling? Because I'm normalizing everything. First, if yi is negative, I'm using an exp an ex exponent function, which makes everything positive. And then since I normalize, it's making this term be between 0 and 1. So that's why we're applying this normalization. If I put a sigmoid there, actually it would still work. In this case, it actually doesn't matter if it's a sigmoid or not. It's just a bit more elegant to use the identity. Um, and so, the likelihood then for a single data point is essentially it's like the Bernoulli but now for three classes. And this is essentially what this is saying. It's equal to, and then you have three cases, e to the yi, one divided by the sum when yi equal one, and the sum basically is this guy. e to the y i 2 divided by the sum when y i is equal to 2 and e to the y i 3 divided by the sum when y i is equal to 3. Okay, so it's the same as the Bernoulli trick. It's a categorical distribution for three variables. And now we've just parametrized the success probability of each of the classes in this categorical distribution uh, with the softmax function, which guarantees. And now, obviously, if you add the three success probabilities, you get one. So you have a valid probability distribution, and each term is between zero and one. That's it. It's just basically flipping coins, except that now the coins have, I guess, three faces. If you want the cost function, what do we do to get the cost function? Yeah, exactly. Cost function is just equal to the negative log of p of y given x comma theta, and I'm going to do it for all the all of them, and that's just. the sum from i equal 1 to n and then it's going to be the sum from j equal 1 to 3 i 
j of yi times the log of essentially e to the y j y i j divided by essentially the sum. Okay. So it's again a cross entropy error function but with three classes. So you minimize uncertainty. Minimizing uncertainty is equivalent to maximizing likelihood. Oops, I missed a negative there. Okay. So that's essentially how we get the cost the cost function. So we have a cost function for multi class. We know the cost function for um, we know the cost function for um, regression. We know the cost function for uh, you know two class, which is sort of actually subsumed by multi class. So once we know the cost functions, or equivalently, we know the likelihoods, uh, we know how to regularize them by just adding theta transpose theta. And we also um, know how to proceed to get an estimate of theta. We just differentiate the log likelihood, we equate to zero, and solve for theta. In this case, we can't solve for theta exactly, so instead we, we will do gradient descent. Or you can do Newton's method. And if you do gradient descent, you can do many batches, or you can do online, or you can do the full batch of the data. So getting ahead a bit, this is what we're going to try to do. We're going to derive expressions for the gradient of the neural network of those cost functions. And when we do that, we will end up with nice equations that will look like this. So these equations will basically tell us how to update a new theta. Essentially, in the first case, in the batch case, at iteration k, the new, and this will be true for each theta, so we'll do the gradient for each theta. So theta j, where j could be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, uh, for this example, will be the old value of theta and then plus uh, the gradient with respect to that theta j. Okay, that's how we're going to minimize the cost function of the gradient, um, in this case for regression. And then for online, we wouldn't take the sum over all the data, we would just take the current data. So tweets, lots of data, you might not be able to load all that data into memory, in which case you might want to do it online. When you do it online, you can actually do several passes through the data to keep improving the results. Okay, let's see how we get these um, gradients. Okay, so how do we do? I'm going to do regression. For the homework, you have to do binary classification. So I'm using it. I'm going to use a quadratic error function, and I'm looking at the online problem. So I'm only looking at the current um, error at um, at time i or data point i for the i-th data point. Okay, so my error is the difference between y and y hat squared in regression. When you do binary classification, it's not going to be this cost function. It will be the cross entropy. So it's all about just plugging in the right cost function. We differentiate this cost function. Suppose that I want a derivative, derivative with respect to theta j. The derivative of the error function with uh, respect to theta j um, is just, well, we just follow the chain rule here. So it would be minus 2 times the difference between y and y hat. And then we need to take the derivative of yi hat with respect to theta j. Now, the first term is kind of done. It's just the difference between the prediction and the actual y. And it makes sense because you want to take a step in the gradient so as to minimize that difference. And then so the next term is the derivative of the output with respect to the theta j. So in order to compute the gradient in a neural network, <coughs> the only thing you'll be able to need to know is how to compute the derivative of the output of the neural network with respect to each parameter. 
that's the chain rule and for neural networks it has a special name, it's called back propagation and we'll see soon why it's called that. So suppose you want a derivative with respect to theta 5 then I argue it's just theta 1 and the reason is because y hat is just equal to theta 5 plus theta 6 times output 1 1 plus theta 7 times output 1 2 okay. right that's essentially the function that the network is implementing and so if I take the derivative with respect to um, theta 5 I just get 1 because there's a 1 there multiplied so I get this guy if I take the derivative of this function with respect to theta 6 I just get output 1 1 where output 1 1 is equal to a sigmoid with what terms in the exponent? Exactly, theta 1 minus theta 2x. Okay. How do I get output 1, 1? I take the input x, I feed it through the network. So typically the way we to implement this is we do a forward pass to get all the o's and all the u's. So we first do a forward pass and then derivatives is just plugging it in. So like the derivative with respect to theta 6 is just output 1, 1. Likewise, the derivative with respect to theta 7 is output 1, 2. The next derivative, so, so we already know how to do the gradient for theta 5, theta 6, and theta 7. Okay, so the next ones will be the ones that will get a bit more interesting. So in particular, okay, so this is my y hat, which in this case is just u2, 1. Um, in particular, I have, if I want a derivative of y hat, with respect to, let's pick one, theta three. That's going to be equal using the chain rule, the derivative of y hat with respect to, so theta three is in this path, so I get to theta three by following this path. And this is such what back propagation will be. I need to take the derivative with respect to O12. Then I need to take the derivative of O1. Oops. I need to take the derivative. Oh, so used to theta. Of output 1, 2 with respect to U12. And then the derivative of U12 with respect to theta 3. This is back propagation. If you want to compute a derivative, you need to follow the path from the output to the parameter by doing the chain rule. So the, the picture, the graph, it just allows you to see visually what it is. And, you know, it's just a tool to help you with the chain rule. And so what is this equal to? Um, I'm going to put here a simple theorem. The derivative of output 1, output 1, 2 with respect to u1, 2 is equal to o1, 2 times 1 minus o1, 2. I.e., the derivative of 1 over 1 plus e to the minus x with respect to x is equal to 1 over 1 plus e to the minus x times 1 minus 1 over 1 plus e to the minus x. I ask this quite often in, in exams to prove this result. I'm not going to prove it in classes. I, I suggest you, you try this out. Okay. So 
the derivative with respect to O12 is just theta 7. Okay, because y hat is equal to theta 7 times O12 plus theta 6 O11 plus theta 5. The derivative of O12 with respect, the derivative of sigmoid is just equal to basically that sigmoid times 1 minus the sigmoid. And then if we look at this graph here, we know that U12 is equal to theta 3 times x plus theta 4 times 1. And so the derivative of u12 with respect to theta3 is just x. And that's your derivative, you're done. And the rest of the derivatives is exactly um, the same thing. Okay, so you just follow the various paths. If you want it with respect to theta4, it's going to be exactly the same thing except instead of x you're going to have a 1 because you're going to slightly change to this path. And then if you want the other two parameters, you need to follow the path through the upper near. And this will give you all the derivatives. So you get terms of this form, the parameter times this sort of term times the input. And that's what's here. And now the, the whole thing is you have the difference. Okay, so recall that the gradient consists of uh, two terms, the difference and then there was the derivative of y hat with respect to the parameter and so that's what you're seeing here, the difference and the derivative of y hat with respect to the parameter that's it, that's your algorithm and you will get one of these equations for each of uh, the parameters actually let's see if this is right because theta 6, should, that shouldn't be theta 6, I think I made a typo here let's correct it now Really? It's 011. It's, I'm going via 011 uh, to xi, so this is for theta 2, sorry. Right. Because for theta 2, I would follow the path. Um, I'm following this path, basically. Make sure the middle one, the, the last theta, is supposed to be theta 2. I thought we just showed that it was theta 7 and then it was that Oh, no, that was with respect to theta. Uh, oh, I see, with respect to theta 3. And so this should be half. So this would be the guy that multiplies, which is theta 6. Okay, thank you. But basically you just need to be careful following each path and then you'll get each derivative. Now, as you do this, you'll see that there's a pattern here. All these derivatives look the same. And so it's with a little bit of thinking, you can put all this as a single matrix vector multiplication, squash that vector through a multivariate of the sigmoid that just gives you as an output the vector in Python. And then the derivative computation, these guys themselves, you can vectorize it all as matrix vector multiplications. So I haven't done that matrix vector vectorization because that confuses the, the issue. But when you implement the code, that's the way you should do it. And, and the reason why I'm using these U12, uh, O12, that means hidden layer neuron 2. So U12 is the first layer, the second neuron, the first layer. And so if you use those indices, you'll see that everything will fit naturally into a matrix. And so the algorithm will be easy. And that's what you need for your last homework. And you just basically get to code this for classification. The only difference is going to be these terms, the second terms will be the same as what I've derived here. This first term was derived for regression. You're going to be doing it for binary classification, so use the cross entropy instead of using the sum of squared error. And that's it. So the hidden layers um, make more sums, and the, these layers 
make more theta terms, I guess? Or I'm just wondering, like, you have to put infinite layers into You can put more layers, or you can put, make layers very fat. Yeah. Um, so this is a good question. So more la and it's actually a very important question in research. So making it fat, and that's just, I'm going to go over some of this on Friday. If you make it big enough with just one hidden layer, you do need